My name is Debbie. I'm um, the Programme Manager for STEM Ambassadors across Scotland and um, I will be um, I'll be guiding you through this session tonight along with Annie who also works at CERC. Um, she'll be talking a little bit in a moment so she'll introduce herself in a bit more detail then. Um, she's also thankfully remembered to press record which I literally made a comment like a minute ago that I was going to forget to record this session so just so you're aware this is being recorded um, so that you can refer back to it after the event and um, if there's anything you want to, to you know maybe hear again or if you want to share it with any colleagues or any of your students or anything like that. So um, just some things to just uh, think about while we're working through the session. So please do have your camera and microphone off while the presenters are speaking and then once they've uh, finished speaking you can um, pop your camera on, uh, unmute yourself to ask questions and that kind of thing. We are encouraging questions to be added into the chat and onto the Padlet. Um, Annie, would you be able to pop the Padlet just into the chat so that people can have a look at that now? That The Padlet's got just a bit of an introduction to the STEM ambassadors that will be speaking tonight um, and you can also pop questions on there as well. And if we don't have time to answer all your questions, if they're on Padlet, it means that we can keep track of them and make sure they get added. So we do recommend that they're on uh, Padlet, but it, if you want to um, unmute yourself and ask a question, you can do that as well. Um, so yes, uh, I will just let you know who will be speaking we'll be speak tonight. tonight. As I said, there is information on the Padlet of who's who um, and uh, the order that everyone will be speaking as well. So first up, we'll have uh, Rebecca. She's going to kick things off with a bit about um, a bio, being a biomedical scientist and why someone might want to become a biomedical scientist. We're then going to hear from Andrea, who's going to talk about her work um, as a senior development manager in the life sciences department um, and kind of talking a little bit more about the business side of things. Um, Sarah's going to um, talk a bit more about ecology. Um, Risha is going to talk about her, her research and then Lee is going to finish off um, talking a little bit about clinical trials. So after each person has sp spoken we'll have some time for questions um, but we do have quite a jam-packed evening or afternoon. Um, and so I'll pass on to Annie now to um, just give you a bit of an idea of why we decided to run this session. Hi everyone and thank you so much for taking time at the end of your busy day in the classroom to participate in this event today. Um, very briefly, I'm Annie McRobbie and I am the Education Manager for Biology over at CERC. Having just left the classroom back in June, we are I was a biology teacher at Wallace High School. Um, I just, before I pass on to our speakers, I just want to really go through the aims of this event and why we're actually here. So the first thing, um, when Debbie and I decided to put this together, we, we had the career education standard in mind from Scottish Government. And if you're not entirely familiar with this document, it basically outlines the entitlement of all young people across Scotland to an education that supports their understanding of the world of work. And as teachers, it's our responsibility to ensure they have the knowledge and understanding to allow them to make informed decisions about their future pathways. So hopefully through the five speakers we've got today, you'll, you'll see a wide variety of pathways and things that have gone wrong and things, twists and turns and, and the different opportunities across Scotland um, that are there for our young people. The second thing is, um, if we can just move that one on, um, is whilst career um, information is obviously really important, through the speakers today, you'll also hear about huge innovation that's going on through the work of our, our some of our speakers today. And that will help you deliver actually part of the curriculum. So not just even at senior phase talking about careers as they prepare for UCAS and going off to university, but even like if you look at the third and fourth level outcomes on the screen, thinking about how scientists from Scotland have contributed to innovative research. So hopefully, even in terms from a curricular point of view, you'll find something really useful in this event today. Another thing, so our third aim, is actually thinking about another Scottish government policy around learning for sustainability. And while sometimes 
that's going to conjure up ideas of climate change and the environment. It's also about our responsibility to help all of our young people develop into these global citizens who understand their their impact in the wider world and and the role that being involved with STEM can have. And you'll see through our speakers this afternoon that the impact that they are having and their roles. And by communicating and sharing that with our pupils in the classroom, we're delivering on this policy too. And then finally, as all CERC um, professional learning will be, um, it's going to marry up with the GTCS professional standards for registration. And even if I've just shoved that screenshot in there, even just looking at that last sentence there about yet another responsibility we have as teachers is to try and connect that learning in the classroom to, to skills for learning life and work. So even if through the course of this week or next week, get yourself onto your profile and update that because this is an, an important contribution that you're making to your own professional development by, by learning more about um, the careers across Scotland. OK, so I think without further delay, I'd like to pass on to our first speaker, who is Rebecca Wright, and she is a lecturer working um, with students up in Aberdeen at Robert Gordon University. Thanks, Annie. I'll just try and share my screen now. Um, so thank you very much for having me and thank you everybody for attending. Um, Annie introduced myself. I'm Rebecca Wright. I'm a lecturer at Robert Gordon University up in Aberdeen, but I'm also a registered Health and Care Professions Council biomedical scientist. So over the next few slides, I'm going to explore the exciting and varied role that biomedical scientists have in healthcare. The motto of any biomedical scientist is right test, right patient, right time. And this is because biomedical scientists are responsible for the processing, analysis and interpretation of clinical tests requested for a patient. So if you've ever had um, a blood test, a urine sample, a swab, a piece of tissue collected, or anything scraped or squeezed from yourself, it's likely that that sample had then been sent to a biomedical lab for analysis. Scotland's laboratory workforce makes up a small proportion of the overall NHS workforce. And I think it's something like 2.5%. So what that means in real terms is there's one biomedical scientist for every 30 nurses and for every 11 doctors. So if you've not heard about us before, you're forgiven, we're quite a small workforce. The work of the biomedical scientist is, however, really, really important. And there's been estimates showing that a bit between 70 and 80% of clinical decisions are based upon the results of a laboratory biomedical scientist or clinician. And um, so really important work undertaken by the scientists. In Scotland, we're one nation with about 5.45 million people. Um, and I'm not sure if my slides have gone a bit wonky there. Uh, they have a little bit. Um, yeah, something's happened. Here we go. Right, we're back okay. on track. Um, so over 29 geographical locations, um, there are 93 different labs um, and they range in size and complexity. So smaller labs will have combined disciplines and larger labs, they'll have a provision for each of the clinical disciplines that you can see on the screen. Hematology, transfusion science and clinical biochemistry are seen as the more highly automated labs. So this means that the scientists will be working with complex analytical equipment to analyse patient samples. The other uh, disciplines, histopathology, cytopathology and medical microbiology are seen as more hands on. So much of their work requires precise manual testing. The work performed in each discipline will be varied based upon the unique patient sample that is entered into the lab and each of those have a unique story to tell. So what makes a good biomedical scientist? There's a number of different qualities that a good biomedical scientist would possess. So if the individual is interested in or has a natural aptitude for biology, um, if they're interested in science and technology and how that can apply to diagnosis and monitoring of human health, um, if they enjoy practical hands-on work, 
So this could be uh, troubleshooting in the guts of an analytical piece of equipment, trying to figure out why it's not working. Um, or it could be really manual techniques such as a gram stain trying to categorise bacterial strains. Biomedical science isn't a patient facing role, so they don't normally spend time with patients, but it's important that biomedical scientists are driven to make a difference and to contribute to patient pathways through the meticulous analytical work that they undertake. So I said biomedical science isn't a patient facing role, but you would be working with people if you're a biomedical scientist. You'll be communicating with colleagues in the lab, clinicians and other health and social care providers about the results that you've been analysing and also the requirements for laboratory testing. The pictures on the screen are from the Institute of Biomedical Science, Biomedical Science Day, which takes place in June each year, and they have a photo competition for labs to enter. And these are some of the submissions for the last few years. Um, so life in the lab is uh, really exciting and really interesting. In order to become a biomedical scientist, you must undertake a degree that's accredited by the Institute of Biomedical Science, so that's the IBMS. And this would allow you to register with the Health and Care Professions Council as a biomedical scientist. So even if you undertake a degree that's um, not accredited, um, but labelled as biomedical science, you wouldn't be able to register with the HCPC. And only by registering are you able to legally use the title biomedical scientist because it's a protected title. Finally, um, it's important to note that I've explained um, uh, the role about the medical laboratory biomedical scientist analysing different types of samples from humans, but the career path of an individual with a degree in biomedical science is really varied. So individuals can carve their own career path to, shoot, uh, to suit their passions and drive. And if an individual would prefer to work in research or industry, then that's an opportunity waiting for uh, anybody with a degree in biomedical science. So I think that's all the slides I've had. Um, I'm happy to take any questions now or in the Padlet. And my email address was on the first slide. So if anybody would want to contact me, um, I'm happy to do that. So thank you very much for listening. If anyone has got any questions, um, you can add it to the Padlet just now or you can un unmute and put your camera on if you like. I've got one in the Padlet just now, but if anyone wants to go first. OK, I'll ask the one that's there. Um, I'll just post it in the chat just in case. So it says um, when you worked in so if you work in something like a haematology lab, what were, would be the top three skills um, that you would recommend? Top three skills. So haematology is my specialist discipline. So that's where I worked um, prior to coming to the university. And I would say the top three skills you would need is definitely an analytical mind, primarily. You are analysing a high volume of patient samples and you need to be quite meticulous and methodical and have a good eye for detail in order to not miss anything. So um, being kind of uh, analytical in that respect is really important. Paying attention to detail as well and being able to prioritise tasks. So, for example, the lab that I worked in, we analysed about 2,500 samples a day. Um, in Aberdeen. That's one of the larger uh, hospital sites. We were also a reference lab for um, haemophiliac patients, so patients with bleeding disorders, and being able to prioritise what's urgent, what's a clinical emergency that needs your attention at that point in time, or what can be left as more of a routine task. Being able to work in teams is really important, but most labs, I think the only one that isn't a 24 hour service would be pathology. Um, so histopathology and cytopathology. So being able to work independently as well is really important. So we would work night shifts and you would be there just by yourself um, through the night from about uh, 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. So being able to work independently is a really key skill as well. Thanks so much, Rebecca. If there's no other questions, I think you finished bang on time and I think I'll pass back to Debbie to introduce our next speaker. Thank you.
Great, thank you so much. That was fantastic, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, so next up we've got um, Andrea. Um, she works at Highlands and Islands Enterprise and yeah, she's going to tell us a little bit more about her journey and um, how she ended up where she did and the decisions that she made along the way. So I will pass over to her now. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. I hope you can see my slides OK. Um, so I'm Andrea McCall. I'm a senior development manager for life sciences at Highlands and Islands Enterprise. So that probably doesn't mean much to you. Highlands and Islands Enterprise is basically an arm's length body uh, from the Scottish government. So what we do is we take the whole of the Highlands and Islands region to visit a large region and we support the businesses and communities that are within that region. So all we want to do is support businesses to grow, employ more people, develop more products and services and sell those. But we also support communities who are, you know, sometimes very remote along the west coast or on the islands, and we want to help them grow, offer more opportunities for their young people and, and make it an interesting place to live, work and invest. So just to explain a little bit about what I do. So I work in the life sciences team, a very small team, um, but we cover a lot of interesting sectors. So we deal with companies who work in biotechnology, medical devices, animal health, aquaculture um, and digital health. So there's a lot of different things that are going on. So it's not like I'm a specialist in any of these sectors, but I'm expected to know a little bit about everything, be like a fountain of knowledge and more importantly, know where more information can be found. If someone comes to me, either a local business or a business that uh, maybe wants to locate in our area and is just trying to get a feel for the lay of the land, they would come to me and I would say to them, oh, there's this researcher at the University of the Highlands and Islands that works in active health, you should speak to them. Or there's this other company that could offer a complementary service to what you do. So a lot of it is about relationship building and knowledge sharing. Um, a lot of my work also evolves around um, communication, promotion, marketing. So we, I'm very active on social media. I'm always there sharing events, sharing funding opportunities, sharing things that people would be interested in because we also are meant to obviously guide people into the right direction where they can get more support, where they can get more funding um, and where they can maybe find people who could work for them. Um, one aspect also is, as I said before, I could deal with people who are not yet located in our area, but want to open a business here. So we have um, infrastructure, we have property, for example, on Inverness campus that um, offers um, small offices and labs for businesses. So I would maybe take people on a site tour, show them around, show them um, who they could meet with, who they could uh, work with and show them um, the property and the offices. Um, so no day is the same really, um, but three of the projects I work with at the moment, I want to just mention here, um, it's all about business support. As I was saying, so we have an accelerator program where we support entrepreneurs who want to maybe start up their business and need a bit of advice. I don't necessarily provide the advice myself on how to get your first customer and how to develop your product, but I have consultants who work for me basically um, who can provide that advice. So a lot of my work is also about project management and contractor management. So again, it comes down to communication skills and, you know, making sure everyone does what they need to do at the right point in time and make co connections between them all. Um, as I said, we have a we have property, so we have a co-working space where people in life science and technology work together. So I'm organizing events and um, webinars and, and things like that to connect people together. Um, so that's also quite important. And on the left, again, a lot of social media promotion. Either I write content, marketing content, or again, I have agencies, marketing agencies who do that for me. But again, I need to instruct them on what needs done. So my job is very much office based um, at the moment, very much um, online, but uh, in a usual world without a pandemic, we would actually have a lot of networking events and I would even visit other uh, businesses, other networking events uh, in the UK and overseas as well. Um, I think that was all I had on my list or trying to describe what I do. A lot of it is also about writing reports and asking for, mon for more money to do more things like this um, so that you have to really be good at arguing your case uh, in a written format as well. 
just a little bit about background where I come from, explaining my journey and how I ended up um, as a basically a business advisor rather than a scientist. So I'm from Germany originally. Um, I did biology at school and I really um, was very interested in everything to do with genetics, immune, immunology, virology, and that really inspired me to go and study uh, biology at a university at Würzburg, which is um, more towards the middle of the country. And I actually spent a lot of time doing genetics and things like that, but I also dealt um, with um, animals like uh, insects, social animals like ants and bees and wasps, which is completely different and nothing I've done since, but really, really interesting. Um, and I did a final year project that used the, the fruit fly here in the picture as a, as a, uh, a model organism. After that, um, I decided to do my PhD abroad. Um, I wanted to explore different countries, so I ended up in Dundee at the university. Um, I was in the hospital labs researching for my biomedical research PhD, and I was working on the HIV virus um, in a cell-based um, lab. While I was doing that, I realized that actually being in the lab was interesting and, you know, science was still my passion, but I didn't really want to spend the rest of my days in a lab environment. And I didn't really think the career path open to me in that way was suited to what I wanted to do. So I was looking around for other opportunities. And while I was still doing my PhD, I did an online um, long distance um, course on science communication with a view to to do something different after my PhD. And I actually managed to get a couple of small articles published in a, in a lab magazine that was um, written in a kind of public style. So not like a specialist science uh, style, but a bit more uh, aimed at the general public. And I was lucky enough after my PhD to find a job at Highlands and Islands Enterprise in Inverness. At the time, Highlands and Islands Enterprise was running the STEM ambassador program for the north of Scotland. So I joined their team as a marketing and communications manager initially on a maternity cover for one year, but that contract um, came to an end and I had an opportunity to apply for a different job. And um, that just took me through my uh, through different stages um, and different departments at Highlands and Islands Enterprise to the life sciences team, which was obviously a perfect fit. Um, so I've been in a team for a while now and it's been, yeah, as I said, no day is the same and it's very interesting, but completely different from what I did before. Nothing lab related at all, but my background enables me to, you know, have a better understanding of the technical things that the businesses I deal with work on. I can understand when they tell me about different things they do in the lab and the build and to develop, which helps me to, I suppose, um, give them better advice or point them in the right direction. The, the other thing is obviously I had to learn on the job. So, you know, I had never worked in an office before. I had no idea about business. So I had opportunities while I was working to um, attend training courses and, and pick up some of those skills on the job. So being flexible and, and eager to learn was definitely useful. Um, and just some, some pictures at the end because I was told I should add some fun pictures. So here's a couple of pictures of my pets, um, my chinchilla and my guinea pig. Um, me volunteering at the Scottish SPCA um, and my other hobbies, triathlon and ballroom dancing, um, which again is, is something that takes a lot of time, but is very, um, very much fun. That's me. Great. Thank you, Andrea. A nice lighthearted way to end it. I like it. Um, so there's a question in the Padlet, which is what aspects of high school learning were the most useful um, for carrying out your job um, and is there anything you wish you'd learn more about? Yes, yeah, so I guess useful for me was to get a good breadth in different subjects and you know now in hindsight I think it was really helpful to know um, a lot about biology, chemistry, physics, maths, just to have a general understanding of the types of things the businesses that I work with develop and, and need to know about. I wish I had done a little bit more on the um, business side of things um, because that would have been helpful. I didn't have, wouldn't have had to learn that now. I could have learned that earlier in my career. Um, I also wish I had learned more about practical things like how to really use an Excel spreadsheet to its full potential, um, those types of things. But, um, you know, if you, and I suppose writing in different types of styles, you know, be able to write a very scientific report, 
um, very factual, but also learn to write things that are more aimed at the general public, that are more marketing related things. Um, just be clear about what is needed for different audiences. Absolutely. And I think it's really interesting the bit as well about sort of uh, links with with business and thinking about communicating on social media and, and, and things like that is, is really a uh, really useful skill to have. Right. Yeah, and it's it's difficult to anticipate these things. Obviously, you don't know where you end up. And I guess that's one of the messages, isn't it? You know, you you just do your best at the time and you always have an opportunity later to upskill and do do more training on the job. And, um, you know, once you're clear on what you want to do, you, you do have opportunities further down the line. I guess it's that willingness to always learn, which is quite yeah, like, yeah absolutely. Thank you so much, I'm Andrea. I'm going to pass back to Annie now. OK, thank you so much. Um, right, third up, we have got a bit of change in direction and we're going to hear from Sarah, who is an ecologist. So we're going to hear what it's like to get out and about in Scotland. So over to you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. Yeah, that's perfect. Great. So, hi, I'm Sarah um, and I am a ecologist working at Land Use Consultants um, and I'm just going to talk to you guys. It's not moving next. Um, through my path into uh, my career now, uh, what it's like working as an ecologist and um, maybe flag up some tips um, to forward on to any students who would like to develop a career in this sector and I'll leave time for questions at the end. So I uh, left school in 2012 with um, the hires um, actually didn't do amazingly well in biology, but um, I did find uh, geography and administration um, a bit easier because they were in sixth year. Um, so I used these um, qualifications to go to Edinburgh Napier University and study animal biology. And then I wasn't sure um, what I wanted to do after that. So I moved um, into a master's straight after that to do wildlife biology and conservation. And it was during that time that I kind of decided oh, it would be quite good to be an ecologist. Um, it was a job and a career available to me with my degree. Um, so I got a job as a graduate ecologist at Ellendale Environmental, where I worked for a few years. And then I moved to a slightly larger company, um, LUC, this year, um, which was a really good move because I've been able to work with uh, a larger amount of people on different projects. So the sort of things that I get up to um, varies depending on the time of year, but between kind of spring and summer, I'm out doing surveys, um, phase one habitat surveys, and then the more detailed NBC surveys, that's uh, bot botany and um, plant identification and habitat classification. And then alongside that, there's protected species surveys. So they are um, anything from red squirrels to badgers. Um, we'll, we will be out surveying um, bats as well at night time. And then these surveys feed into what's known as ecological appraisal and impact assessment. And these are the sort of appraisals that need to be done before any big developments take place, like wind farms, road duelings, housing developments. And another part of the job is also supervising on site when they are constructing these developments, making sure that everything's done within the law in terms of the environment. And so things that I enjoy about my job and maybe some of the challenges that I face um, it's an amazing job because you're out, you're seeing wildlife that you wouldn't really see anywhere else. Um, remote parts of Scotland, seeing golden eagles and pine martens and just coming across badger sets on your your day to day work life, which is really cool. You get to travel a lot of places and work pays for that travel. Um, so I've been to Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland with my work. I like working with like minded people who also care about nature and the environment. I'm always learning new things. Not a day goes by where I don't learn something new. 
I like the fact that I'm working in an area which um, feeds into kind of sustainability and working in an area which is beneficial to the environment and trying to protect the environment which hopefully um, my job makes a positive impact on developments and um, nature and wildlife. But some of the things I'm not so keen on, um, definitely midges. Um, I have to say working in the rain and all weather can be really challenging. The job is physically demanding. I'm regularly out walking across um, hills and moorlands. It's um, There's no paths where we go, so it's quite physical. Also, bat surveys, they're done at night time and early in the morning, so you're working on sociable hours. You don't usually get extra pay for that. And when you're working in remote parts of the country, you also need to stay away from home. This could be for, especially for graduates, it can be for like six months of the year, Monday to Friday, um, but usually not at the weekends. And so there's a few fun photos of me um, in action. And then um, I'll just move on. So kind of wider opportunities which may um, go into after or before becoming an ecologist um, is GIS, Geographical Information Systems. It's quite closely connected to what we do. Um, we collect our data on tablets now in the field and then this needs to be digitised and it ends up looking like a map um, on the right side of the screen. So it's um, also another kind of opportunity that um, students might find themselves going into after studying in environmental science and environmental impact assessment, which is kind of the overarching um, document and work that needs to be done for wind farms before they are given planning permission. Um, this is something that I'm going to mo be moving into next January. Um, it's more of a project management role as opposed to being um, in the field and um, doing site work. Um, and it's not just ecology that's assessed, it's biodiversity, water, air, climate change, all to do with the environment. So it's really interesting. And other examples, Nature Scott, RSPB, these are um, sectors that employ people that have done similar degrees to me. The charity sector can be very, very competitive, so it's good to start volunteering with them early. Um, and Nature Scott are starting to advertise more placements and modern apprenticeships, which is really good. Um, so I've just added a few links and stuff onto my Padlet that you can um, either have a look at yourself or pass on to any students who are keen in this type of career, but also the SAIM, the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management. There's a lot of inf really good information on there for, for students or people who want to become an ecologist. And so I'll just leave it there and let you guys ask any questions. Thanks so much. Yeah, that was um, fantastic to hear all that. And I know that I've had pupils in the past who would have really benefited from hearing um, about your experience. And one thing, the, the question that's come up here is about volunteering and you said a little bit about um, the role of that in your experience how important was that in terms of being able to stand out from the from the crowd and what kind of volunteering did you do and how did you go about organizing that when you were in school? I think um, it's not really something to worry about imminently um, but um, it's something I started doing when I was at university um, so I had a part time job in Starbucks as well, so I didn't have a lot of free time to actually do volunteering, which was kind of a worry for me because I knew how important it was for people getting into this type of career. But I just took the approach of doing like one day things like maybe a few hours on a weekend and um, signing up to very, very cheap, like 10 to 30 pounds um, um, ID, plant ID, bird ID courses. Um, join in kind of local nature groups where you get to go out with experts for free. I didn't like some people think you need to go to some tropical country and do um, turtles or something, but I didn't have the funds for that or the time for it. So um, you don't have to do great big things, maybe just one day here or there, maybe just shows that you're very keen and interested and willing um, and get a kind of wider experience. Um, but 
Also, if you want to work in Scotland, make sure you're aware of the nature and the wildlife in Scotland, not just all across the world. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's actually really, really reassuring. And one of the things that just picking up on the last thing that you said there, um, I'd been to SEEN, which is the Ecology and Ecology Learning Centre in Scotland. It's one of the things they'd made a comment on that young people aren't particularly good at identifying Scottish wildlife anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's um, maybe something to pick up on in your own um, volunteering. That's great. Thank you so much. No I'll pass back to Debbie. Thank you so much, Sarah and Annie. Um, OK, so we're going to uh, now hear from Risha. Um, Risha is going to take us back to the uh, the biomedical um, train of thought and um, tell us a little bit about her experience and research. So I will hand over to you, Risha. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, I hope I'm audible enough and I'll share my slide. Can you see my slides now? Yeah, I can see them. They're still in PowerPoint. There we go. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah, yeah OK. So um, uh, we talk a little about general interest in biology and then when I took my career into the world of bioengineering and biomedical research. So uh, I am a biomedical researcher, a postdoctoral researcher in the University of Edinburgh. And um, if I look at my journey, I started uh, in high school with biology and it was one of my favorite subjects and then I in my undergraduate and my postgraduate studies I went on to do Bachelor of Technology and Master of Technology in Biotechnology. My postgraduate was a little more uh, specific on industrial biotechnology and during the time I realized that research is something that I'd like to continue doing. Um, the, the perks of working in a lab and finding new things every day was enormous to me. So I continued uh, with my doctorate studies in uh, bioanalytical techniques where I mostly dealt with food technology and finding uh, any kind of contaminants or harmful substances in food. So with that experience I have now uh, in I'm now in Edinburgh for the last one year where I am doing similar kind of analytical techniques but on biomedical samples where we try to find out any kind of uh, harmful uh, disease causing pathogens. So this is what I basically do uh, now, especially for young students to get, get a grasp of, is uh, we design some molecules that will bind uh, these dangerous bugs uh, that are present inside the body. And then we link the binding molecules to a light generating molecule. So the binding molecule uh, is chemically synthesized in lab. Um, you can see uh, needle like crystals, which is amazing. Uh, to, to, to work with and then uh, I also generate the light generating molecules which you can see kind of glows in darkness under a certain uh, radiation of light. So on, on mixing the lichen and the dye we get a molecule that can bind to the uh, bugs and if we put this entire system under a microscope we can actually see the bugs lighting up in dark uh, which will help us to identify that there are some pathogens that are there in the sample. So that is an actual image image uh, of which I took of yeast cells, uh, a disease causing yeast cells in uh, their normal fluid medium. So that's how we try to diagnose. And uh, if uh, I start with my inspiration. I would say the nature was my biggest inspiration from childhood. So in growing up in India, uh, it, we I did appreciate a lot of wildlife around, whether it was flora or fauna. And these are some of the photographs that has been taken by me in the uh, natural reserves in India. So I always was amazed at how the animals uh, survived and how they were differently. They had different morphologies, different habits and different ways of uh, herd behavior. So that always interested me and in school I grew up liking human physiology part of biology the most. Uh, I also liked the zoological and botanical classifications, the plants and animal kingdoms. Um, I had a penchant for <laughs> remembering scientific names as well. So these were very interesting. But I think what draws students the most is the practicals and the projects that you have hands on training on. So I was really interested in making those herbarium sheets where we used to take plant samples and then 
press them and dissecting uh, animal and plant tissues, uh, excursion stores where we would see that how different plants were arranged and how the animals uh, behaved. Uh, but I uh, also wanted to say that biology was not the only subject that I was interested in. I was quite good at maths and I really loved uh, mathematics. And that's where I want to bring in that it is a myth that people who are not very good in maths go towards biology. It's a complete uh, wrong notion because uh, mathematics is something that is used in all subjects. And now uh, I realize how important it is also for me to have loved that subject because that is so much applicable to the biological studies that I do now. Uh, so it's not not necessarily the people who are good in maths has to go with uh, physics or computer science. You can also go into biology and like it. I, uh, as hobbies, I liked reading and painting, and this is one of my painting of the human heart. I think uh, high school uh, uh, when I did a project on coronary diseases. So in my undergraduate and postgraduate, I realized that. Uh, uh, studying just basic science in biology or uh, the fact that you have to go into medicine uh, uh, after you study biology is not necessarily true. I mean, that was the kind of thought process which was there that you always have to have a BS or a MS or a BSc or MSc or uh, a, a doctorate degree. But uh, I realized that you can also apply the biological knowledge into technologies. So you can actually build things, design things, make things, engineer things with the help of your biological knowledge and uh, somewhere a few days ago I heard that civil engineers save most more people than doctors so uh, being an engineer is uh, no way uh, in any kind less uh, taking from biology so we can get that and if you are also interested in computer science then we can merge biology and computer science together to become data scientists bioinformaticians which is like a highly demanding field of work right now we can learn about economics and go into bioeconomic studies and of course learn about civil laws and apply them in IPR management and biology. So in my career as bioengineer, I realized there are so many avenues that uh, one can go into uh, besides just lab bound research. There are so many other ways that you can take up biotechnology or biomedicine. So the entire point is to use a biological ma material to make a product or design something. So if you if one wants to design vaccines or medicines right now, we know how important vaccines are when uh, scientists all over the world put all their minds together and just came up with a COVID vaccine within a matter of six months, which normally takes years to do. So we know how much potential biotechnology has to make new products, new drugs and um, uh, sell them in the market as uh, essential materials. And we can also go into areas of like food technology, whether you want, you have an interest to develop a new flavor of whiskey or a gin, you can mix them, make a new supplement to food, make a new colorant that you can add to food. Or do you want uh, to check if food is safe to eat, whether uh, it is, it is, you can quickly identify it safe from unsafe food or spoiled from fresh food. Whether you go into agriculture, technology and design new machines for harvesting and crop improvement. And even if uh, one is interested into the tiny knickknacks of gene therapy or medicine, you can go into biotechnological uh, avenues. Uh, so whether, as Rebecca said, if you want to diagnose and screen for diseases uh, with quick yes or no techniques, whether you can find some ways. And if you are so much into molecular biology or genetic engineering, develop gene therapy and sorts. So as as a person who has spent her career and has always been interested in this sort of topic, I would say the real way of inspiring young minds is to show them around that everything around us is basically nature and life and somewhere related to biology. So whether uh, we can see the leaves browning right now in autumn, so why do that, why does it happen that way? And why does do eggs solidify on heating? Or why does uh, the firefly light up? Because I have actually used the biomolecule that creates the light in the fireflies to tag uh, many of the foodborne uh, disease causing pathogens. And I really think that that is something that we need to 
get involved in to see the nature around us and to find the relevance in everyday life. And this was uh, the sequoia at the Royal Botanical Gardens, which I clicked when I visited there. And I always wonder that there is no pumping system or motor, but how does uh, water and food get pumped so high up into the plants? So these are things around us that we can get uh, really interested in. and. Um, as I said, that it is important to ask uh, at a young age what the student or the child is actually interested. Do they want to look into tiny bugs? Do they want to see how the human body works? Or what kind of medicines doctor prescribe? What is the composition of the medicines? Can we make something new for uh, untreatable diseases like HIV or cancer or coronavirus right now? Or uh, do we want to find out quick uh, prognosis, like uh, without harming the patient, without sharp needles, without withdrawing blood? Can we make disease diagnosis easy? Uh, and even so, do you even like to peek inside the cells and see how uh, the DNA is there, how the intracellular systems are there? So in any of the things that a student at a young age is interested, they can be veered towards uh, taking up a career in bio uh, biology and biotechnology as well as biomedical science. So um, as many of our friends today have said that there are so many ways, Sarah just talked about uh, ecology and if someone is interested to really conserve nature, save tigers, and if someone is interested to study biological fossils, they can go into paleontology. Good at maths, just become a biostatistician. And of course, if you have a good flair for art or scientific writing, you can go into that. So you can make wonderful careers out of biotechnology. Right now, I am uh, reading a book by Richard Dawkins, who is one of the famous evolutionary scientists. And he has made a like, very good fame and popularity by writing several books on how evolution has shaped the present world. So I think uh, the more we involve in that, the more wonders that we find. It's a love that, uh, has, uh, that has never left me and will never leave me. So that's me about my career and my interest in nature. Uh, questions? Thank you so much for that. It's really interesting to hear about, yeah, the sort of um, yeah, like you say, the application of, of biology and uh, and the sort of technology side of things and how all subjects can really be linked together in in, in a career. Um, I'll, I'll quickly ask you one question as I know we've got the last 10 minutes for Lee, but the one, uh, one of the ones we've got is around coding and that's quite an important skill at the moment. Is that um, something that you use in, in your work or is that something that you know much about? Is is how biology is used, uh, how coding is used in different biological fields? Um, I uh, have not used it very extensively in my work, but what I know from my studies is that uh, there is a lot of uh, programming and coding that is involved in biology because uh, the data that we get, uh, for example, we are studying a variety of animals, uh, like in ecology, as Sarah said, that they are doing a lot of survey on different animals. They can gather the data together and use the bioinformatics programming techniques to uh, model them and then fit them into a curve saying what is the trend of an evolution what is the trend of extinction of a particular animal how does conservation work that way you can do it for finding how the biomolecules inside us align themselves into a field and all there are so many ways in which you can use programming yeah okay thank you so much Risha there are a couple of other questions for you but um, we'll um, we'll maybe see if we've got time at the end or you can maybe pop some answers in, in the Padlet afterwards as well. Yeah. Um, just before I hand over to um, Annie and Lee, um, I have also put a feedback form in the Padlet. It would be amazing if you could give us our, your feedback on this event so that we can know whether or not you want more events like this or if you'd change it in any way or anything like that. So please do fill in that form just in case any of you need to leave spot on half past. Thank you so much and I'll pass back to Annie. Hello again. Um, right, our final speaker today is Lee, who is going to speak about something that's pretty topical um, and thinking more about clinical studies and stuff like that that's been on the news quite a lot. And there's lots of links there as well with um, the higher and advanced higher curriculum. So I'll pass over to, to Lee to hear about her work. Hi everyone, hope you're all still listening and I'll not 
bore you too much, hopefully. And apologies as well. I have got a bit of a cold. So if I'm a wee bit sniffly, I promise you it's not COVID either. It's definitely just a cold. OK, so I work in the clinical trial industry, as we said. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about clinical trials. Um, I know a lot of people don't really know a lot about it. They know it's just this thing that happens in the background. But hopefully explaining a lot that goes into clinical trials, you can realise the potential for jobs in the industry. So clinical trials are the way that we get new medicines to market, basically. So it's how we test that new medicines are effective and safe for patients. So super high level, there's four phases of a clinical trial and it starts at phase one, which is your first in human on a really small number of healthy patients, right up to phase three, which can be a couple of thousand patients of that disease indication. Normally, once your phase three study is finished, then the, the data from your study will be submitted to the regulatory authority and they'll have a look at all that data and say, yes, fantastic, your drug's approved for use. And then it goes to market and you can get it from your doctor or it might need some more work on it. And then the phase four is the sort of post market review where they take that over five, ten years and they just continually gather data and they build a bigger picture. So most clinical trials are based on two types. So it's either testing against your dummy drug, which would be your placebo, and that's just to prove that your drug works. Or they can also test against a, a treatment that's already available. And that's if a, a company is trying to say that their new drug is better than what's already on the market. So it could have better results. It could be cheaper. It could have less side effects. It could work quicker. And on top of that, your trial can have different types of blinding and different designs. And that's really important to make sure that there's no bias when either you're assigning treatments or reporting results. So you don't want uh, an investigator or a clinician to be able to favour and say, oh, I really like patient A, I'm going to make sure they get this drug. If nobody knows what they're getting, then it's completely random. And you also don't want patients to be able to say, oh, well, I know I'm getting this new drug, so I feel better and my elbow feels better and I have less pain. So the the key of clinical trials is to make sure you have valid data that can be reviewed properly and a thorough assessment can be made. So everything we do for clinical trials is about the patient. We always ask ourselves, is it safe and is it ethical for the patient? So every study is reviewed by independent ethics committees in each country. And they're looking at certain things before they give the go ahead for that trial to start. So, for example, does the informed consent process, does it clearly tell the patient what they're agreeing to? You can't have any surprises where they sign up and then a couple of months down the line, they have to get all these procedures done. They look at the design of the study. So are you putting patients through things that they don't necessarily have to be subjected to? You know, as a extra test that they don't need to, are we taking too many biopsies? It also checks, is there enough monitoring in place to make sure that all the patients are safe and throughout? So similar to some of the earlier presentations, are their bloods being taken enough? Are we testing their urine enough? Are we taking, you know, are we doing the right tests when we're looking at their pathology samples? And one of the main questions that always comes up is, particularly with placebo studies, is, is it unethical to expose that patient population to a placebo? So it's very, very rare that for oncology trials, for example, you would have a placebo because it's not ethical to say 50% of patients will receive nothing if these are patients who are seriously ill with cancers. Some other types of study, it's OK. So, for example, gastrointestinal studies, it's quite common for those to be placebo based. So I know there's a lot of talk in the world just now about clinical trials and vaccines and drug approvals, but there's so much work going on in the background across a whole heap of different scientific discoveries. So obviously everybody knows COVID vaccines, I think we mentioned earlier, approved in six months. And that's got to be one of the greatest achievements of science in the last couple of years. But there's so much stuff going on in the background. Oncology is obviously a major thing. So there was a really exciting new drug approved in the UK recently called Trodelve, which has got fantastic responses in breast cancer. There's also companies that are looking at allergies. So they've discovered this skin patch, and um, particularly for children, that stops anaphylactic reactions and death ultimately from that. Um, there's still massive work going on in HIV and AIDS and improving those treatments. And every time one of these new drugs gets approved, it filters down to each NHS health board. So I think at the end of last year, there were six new medicines that got approval. So if you unfortunately had any of these diseases, the chances are you would get one of these drugs when you go to the doctor. 
So looking at specifically what my company does, so I work for a company called Catalan and we are a clinical supplies company. So we have a site in Bathgate that's a custom built facility and um, it's huge. We've got so many fridges and so many freezers and all this space for all this packaging. So we pack and distribute these investigational drugs for clinical trials and we ship them globally all around the world. So Catalan has about 10 depots globally. Um, so we work across that so we can reach basically any country in the world and we mostly do two types of packaging so primary packaging would be for example putting tablets into bottles or tablets into blisters so that's the pack you get of your paracetamol so that picture on the bottom corner there would be one of our automated machines that does that then it goes into secondary packaging, which is your finished patient kit. So it would be putting those blisters into a kit um, with a label. It can be a child resistant wallet or it could be a vial into a carton. It could be a tube of cream into a carton. It really depends per study. So my job is a clinical supply manager. So basically what that means is I am responsible for calculating how much drug patients need for clinical trials and making sure that it's packed on time and I get it shipped to the country that it needs to be so that it can get to that patient. So I review a document called a clinical trial protocol, which is your study Bible basically that captures everything that's in that study. And I take a look at the design of the study. So is there different drugs involved? Is there active? Is there placebo? Is there different comparator drugs? Are there different treatment groups? How many patients do you have? How many patients are going to be in each treatment group? And I have to create a demand plan. So it's very numerical, very analytical, and there's a lot of other things you have to consider. So how much drug is going to be used on a month on month basis? How long is it going to take me to pack drug in Bathgate and get it to Brazil? or get it to Israel or get it to Singapore and think about when does your drug expire? Is it going to expire halfway through the trial and we need to pack more? There's a lot of things you have to consider. So my job is completely office based. Um, so I think it's really important. I know some of us have mentioned it before that to work in STEM, you don't have to be in a lab. You don't have to be in a hospital. You don't have to be in a clinic. I'm completely office based. Well, at the moment I'm home based, um, but I am responsible for running those studies from start to the end. We are assigned different studies and we usually keep them with the same client or the same compound. So at the moment I work in a program of oncology studies. So it's the same compound and different types of cancer. And I am primarily the link between my client and each internal department and I have to drive that study through to fruition. So the majority of my day is emails, meetings, more meetings, more emails. Um, everything is at my desk and I have to make sure that that's coordinated. So some of the key things that you need to work in this industry is communication is absolutely key. The teams I work with are global. I have clients in China, Germany, UK, Spain, the US. So you have to make sure that you can communicate effectively with those clients and then interpret that and then convey that to your internal teams. Similarly with analysis and problem solving, you have to look at your data all the time. How many patients have you got? What's your demand? How many more kits do you need? When do you need it? Problem solving as well. Every day is a, a new problem. Um, I am quite often involved in the kit design. So based on the design of the study, if patients need a certain number of tablets in the morning and a certain number at night, you don't want to design a kit so that a patient's taken home five big shoe boxes home to last them a couple of weeks and they need to keep that in their fridge. That's just not feasible. Um, Similarly with planning and organising, you need to be at least 12 steps ahead. I'm already planning what I need to do in 2024. So you need to be on the ball um, and be able to juggle a lot of plates at once. And I think with most jobs in this day and age, computer literacy, if I don't have it in an Excel spreadsheet, then I don't know how to do it. Um, Excel is definitely key here. So a little bit of how I got here. So in school, loved biology. Um, I did all the classics chemistry, human biology, maths, and then in sixth year I did some advanced hires. I actually originally wanted to do medicine, to do pathology, and I didn't get in. So took a bit of a stumble, took a year out, um, gathered myself back up, and one of my backup degrees was pharmacology. So I thought I'll just go ahead, do that, and I fell in love with it. Um, so still got that passion for medicine and science, but just from a different avenue. 
when I finished my undergraduate, I honestly had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Didn't know what kind of career I wanted to get into, but I still loved education and I loved research. So I stayed on and did my postgrad in biomedical science and I was able to specialise in neuroscience, which I loved. Um, after that, I kind of just fell into the clinical trials industry. Um, I worked for another global company that does the lab testing portion of it and realised there was this whole world of work in clinical trials that was still letting me do what I wanted to do and help patients and have a career in STEM without being in a lab and from that I progressed into the, the industry I am in now. So really the message I want to try and get across today is you don't have to be patient facing to make a difference in medicine and research. I think you've seen today every single one of us works in a STEM career but we're, we're not hospitals, we're not doctors, we're not nurses um, and there's a whole heap of jobs available for anybody that wants to work in this industry. And that's me. Thanks so much, Lee. That was fantastic. Um, and I've got a question. There's there's quite a few questions actually that have come in, but one that is quite interesting that I would like to know as well is earlier on you said about how in a oncology trials you wouldn't have a placebo. So at what point, what type of drug would you say then? it would become ethical to have a placebo. So oncology trials, you're typically comparing an existing drug against the new drug. So they give combination drugs, they're testing combinations of, okay, if you had breast cancer, you would get drug A, but if we give drug A with our drug, you have to take less of it and you get better survival. I have yet to see an oncology drug that has placebo, or it's very, very rare. Um, it really depends on the type of cancer, the stage of the cancer. Um, the clinical trial protocols have all these inclusion criteria and that's why they're so specific and it's so hard to get new oncology drugs to market because you're looking at such a niche patient population. Um, it has to be, for example, the studies I'm working on just now, it's a new bladder cancer and patients can't have had five different treatments first before they're eligible to come into this trial. Um, so they very rarely have placebo in oncology. As I say, it's more common in gastrointestinal studies or psoriasis studies. It's very common in there um, because you have to weigh up the ethical concerns of if you have patients on these trials, but you're not giving them an active drug, what is the impact? Um, and if you're not giving cancer patients an active drug, that's obviously massively significant. And I don't know any company that would let that go ahead. Okay, that's interesting to know that because um, when you're obviously teaching that, you always have this idea that a placebo is part of a controlled trial, so it's really interesting to hear that side. Um, okay, um, I think I'll maybe pass back to Debbie. There's other questions for you, Lee, on the tablet that, oh, on the Padlet that have come in, and for the benefit of um, other people who are listening, Risha and um, Rebecca have added, and and Andrea have added in some of the answers to other questions that were there too. So I'll pass back to you, Debbie, just for a wee minute. Yeah, um, we won't keep you too much longer. Thank you so much for for staying around. I hope you've enjoyed it, and thank you so much to um, our wonderful STEM ambassadors. What we're going to try and do is get all the information on that Padlet, so that can be your go-to uh, resource. Um, I'll keep it so that you can interact with it for the next day or so, um, so that um, the STEM ambassadors tonight can maybe add on, or tomorrow can add on some of the answers, um, maybe upload their presentations as well. And we'll also put the recording of the session on the Padlet as well, so you can look at all of that. I've already put in a column about how to request a STEM ambassador, um, so a little bit about that. And please do just get in touch if you've got any questions about how to do that. Um, and you might also be, if there's someone that you want to speak to a little bit more um, that you've heard from today, um, you know, pop it in the Padlet, email me and see if we can organise something with that, with that specific STEM ambassador. Um, so that's kind of it for me. And I've put my email address and uh, website in the chat as well. OK, I think just because yeah. this is a virtual thing and that's a bit rubbish for for closing off, I'm just going to clap. <laughs> I'm 
<laughs> you're at the end of an assembly or something you would have this great big round of applause but thank you so much to the, the five STEM ambassadors for coming along at the end of your busy day and and sharing all that information with us it was really lovely to hear about all the work that you do oh virtual hands okay yeah that's <laughs> that's the professional way to do it <laughs> um so yeah i think debbie and i are just gonna I don't know if you wanted to say just a wee bit about generally having STEM ambassadors. Do you want me to do the professional learning thing first? Just one yeah, that's kind of my bit about STEM ambassadors. Really, I've put all the info in the in the padlet, so there's there's nothing else from me about uh, STEM okay. ambassadors particularly. Yeah, I, I'll just finish up and just um, make sure everyone's happy who's on about how to access professional learning through CERC. So um, I'll put onto the chat just a link for. Um, the calendar for professional learning for biology through research. There's a number of things that are coming up. If you're new to teaching advanced higher biology, we've got an event at the beginning of December. We've got things for um, maybe new probationers across the different sciences as well in the next couple of months. And also towards February time, we've got things for recently qualified biologists. So even if it's not yourself, if you've got more recently qualified teachers in your department, if you can share that with them and see if there's anything there that will help their practical developments. I think um, over the past couple of years with COVID and things, some of the newer teachers have had less experience with practical in the classroom. So I'll I'll shove that link into the chat um, and you know where I am at CERC if you want to contact me about anything. I've also added a professional learning column onto the Padlet so you can pop the, the link to the website or whatever it might be in there and, and share your email address or whatever, whatever you might want to do. Thank you. Okay, that's it from me, actually. If you um, are happy. I feel like we need the round of applause again now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe we'll round up and let everyone go home and get their dinner. Um, <laughs> So thank you so much. Um, if that's everything from everyone, um, I hope to hear from you all soon and we'll post out the final link to the Padlet with questions probably towards the afternoon, end of the afternoon tomorrow and presentations and things will be on there too. So thank you so much for coming along at the end of your working days today and see you soon.